Hello everyone. This time around I want to talk about complexity in programming. In particular, necessary complexity and unnecessary complexity. Now, necessary complexity is where is it, it arises from the, the nature of the problem you're trying to solve. A complex problem is necessarily going to have a complex solution. Um, and the level of complexity is going to be pretty much related to the complexity of the problem. There's a lot of cases where you've got a lot of complicated or simple steps that you have to string together just to accomplish the task. I'm not talking about the possibility of removing that complexity from a system. You can't. If you want the system to be functional, it has to have all necessary complexity still there. Instead, you want to focus on removing unnecessary complexity. In particular, complexity that doesn't give you any benefits. Uh, you can have complexity that gives you benefits, but isn't strictly necessary. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to have in there, as long as the benefits are worth the trade-off of having more complicated code. Now, this is probably better illustrated by example. Some years ago, I wrote a provisioning system for a uh, web hoster. That provisioning system had certain requirements. The central interface where things were managed was on one system. The web hosting, the web server part, was on another system. And the email hosting part was on yet another system. Now, the central system had to be able to effect change on both the web server and the email server. It had to be able to do that without introducing a massive security hole, which was an unauthenticated connection from the central server back to the remote servers, the email and web servers. There was an additional complication that there were two web servers and two email servers. Now, what do you need to make all of this work? The necessary complexity. Well, you need the user interface on the central system. You need some sort of communication process between the central system and the remote systems. And you need some sort of procedures that can run on the remote systems to do the work that has to be done there. And you also need some procedures that run on the central system that do any work there. So the complexity there that has to be there, you have to have a remote procedure call process of some kind. You have to have a interface of some kind for the users. You have to have the system logic, the centralized system logic on the central server and the remote procedures on each of the remote servers. That's the necessary complexity. Now, there are many different ways you could approach this particular problem. There are plenty of ways to solve it. The first method I used was a communication protocol where the remote servers would run a daemon that connected back to the central server, which would authenticate the remote server, and then it once the connection was established, the, the server side of that connection, the central server, would feed work out to the remote servers with this protocol whenever some work needed to be passed out. This necessitated a scheme where you could submit work into the back end so that this central uh, daemon could pass the work out to the remote servers. So that meant that there were work orders for the back end system and the front end would submit the work orders and the work orders would uh, 
uh, get passed along to the servers as necessary. Now, this system actually worked fairly well for uh, some years. Uh, and it was relatively simple until DNS management had to be added to it. And that broke the um, abstraction uh, a little bit. But eh, it wasn't too bad, and it that was pretty stable, and it worked for quite some time. The central logic of the system was relatively straightforward. Um, it was a little bit poorly designed for the data store, but it worked. Now, there was complexity in the central system that uh, complicated things. Uh, and there was uh, complexity in the communication protocol that complicated things. But there was another piece that came along. Uh, it became necessary at a later date to add webmail to the mix. And that webmail had to be able to authenticate against the right server from a centralized location. That added some complexity to the webmail configuration, but it was only in the webmail configuration. But then it became necessary to allow people logged in on the webmail to modify certain aspects of their accounts, uh, their passwords, and uh, filter settings, spam filter settings. So that added a need for some sort of API system from the central system so the webmail system could actually uh, effect those changes. And that required uh, a more immediate feedback to the, to the user than the provisioning system required because the provisioning system was used by generally by people who had some idea what they were doing. So that required a redesign of the uh, central system back end and that introduced a uh, API to the back end that separated the web interface from the back end system and the uh, API was used by the web interface and it was also used by the webmail interface. Well that added a level of complexity in there that was probably not useful. Um, and it actually turned out that in implementing the front end web, web interface for the uh, provisioning system that there was a lot of duplication in code at different levels. As every level had to validate things and every level had to pass things through and then take it apart and do whatever it needed to with it. And it got really, really complicated. And it got complicated to add new things to it. So there was a level of extra complexity to this system that wasn't really necessary. The webmail thing could have been done without introducing a whole low-level API that the rest of the system used. A simple interface shim could have been made. But that's not how it was implemented. That's not what I ended up doing. Now, fast forward a few years, and the system has uh, not really changed all that much. The requirements haven't changed. But a new design is necessary, uh, a better uh, interface, and this time it needs to tie in with a different account system, one used for managing domain registrations. Now, I could have just stuck with the existing API scheme and just ported the web interface over, but I recognized at that point that it was far more complex than it needed to be far more complex. Uh, so I developed a more complicated system to replace it. Now this you might recognize as second system syndrome. Um, what I ended up doing is I built a uh, work order system 
well, actually, let's start at the top level. There was the web interfaces, and there was two of them, public and internal. And then, because there was shared um, logic between the two, they actually share some back-end um, library files. Uh, and that actually is good um, uh, complexity in this case because it actually reduces code duplication. It adds a little bit of complexity to the uh, web server configuration, but it removes a certain amount of redundancy and you end up with a net win as a result. Now these API, this is an API, but it's not a remote call API. It was direct inclusion in PHP files. Okay, so that part worked pretty well. Now, the bits that had to talk to the servers still had to do the work order thing because uh, the things were still uh, potentially long running. But I recognized that there was bits in the uh, upper level code that had been doing multiple calls in sequence. So I thought I could combine those calls into a higher level work order, which then passes down to a lower level work order, which then, if it needs to, passes things out to the servers as necessary. Now, had I actually designed that sensibly, it might have worked out as I envisioned, and it might have actually improved things. The problem is that when it got down to implementing it, I realized that it was just tedious. Because there was a lot of, uh, the, the majority cases were one high level call coincided with one low level call. And there was a strict separation between high level calls um, uh, calling servers directly and, and all of that jazz. So I ended up with a whole bunch of redundant high-level, low-level calls and it got really tedious. And I think there was maybe one or two cases where one high-level call made multiple low-level calls and it just got really annoying. But one, one improvement I did make at this stage was I separated the uh, work order system from the database system so that the work orders didn't have to hammer on the database. I also changed it so that the, uh, there was an asynchronous mechanism to tell the servers to pull for new work. And that improved fr uh, the front end responsiveness. The problem is I ended up creating a bunch of complicated um, shim code to make all of this stuff work and then I realized that I needed to handle the cases where work orders took too long and uh, things got suspended and all uh, you know and I had to check for if the work was done yet or not and it generally got messy and I, and I realized that I had to do this at, at multiple layers and I had a bunch of redundant code. It just wasn't good. I also had two daemons that had to run on the server side, in addition to the daemon that had to run on the client side, on the remote servers. So this was one more daemon than I had under the old system. And it added a bunch of redundant code. It added a bunch of complicated uh, relationships anytime you needed to change something. So it actually got messy really fast. And it also in, inhibited expanding the system, adding new features. Now, fast forward a few more years, because this system did work and worked quite stably for quite some time. Fast forward a few more years, and I realized that I need to change how the backend system is working. Now, to uh, give you a picture on the complexity that had accrued over time, there was a daemon that ran in the back end to talk to one of the domain registries, which was accessed through some sort of a remote procedure call uh, API. Um, and that was done to uh, uh, improve responsiveness uh, on the system when multiple uh, requests were going on and to serialize them so you didn't end up with a hundred requests opening a hundred communication channels. 
Um, and there was the two uh, work order level demons. And then there was, of course, the demon running on the remote server. There still were the two uh, front-end interfaces, the public one and the internal one, and the mail server and the web server were still on separate servers from the central provisioning system. And that's actually a, a good thing, so I realized that I wanted to keep that separation. What I realized, though, is I had... Uh, several points where different things were communicating either across networks or between processes. And I realized that they all work the same way. They passed a message from one place to another. So I came up with a simple protocol, which no doubt dozens of other people have come up with exactly the same protocol, uh, which is basically a JSON encoded string with a length. That's a packet. Uh, this is not a magically new idea. Um, I built a, uh, a shim program that uh, uh, could uh, listen and uh, feed the requests off to uh, a backend handler. Uh, and uh, that could be used to run a daemon somewhere. Uh, and have the back end written in any programming language it wants and just communicate over the standard input and standard output. I then uh, used that to replace the communication uh, channel to the uh, daemon that talks to that one registry and then I was able to rewrite that daemon in a manner that uh, doesn't have uh, the significant uh, issues with uh, uh, programming language and uh, structure and it can actually access the uh, configuration for the uh, uh, rest of the system so it's uh, more unified uh, and I was able to use that same uh, communication method to build a simpler, uh, uh, long-running work call, um, the background call, which runs in a, uh, a daemon that, uh, so it works on a, a queue and a back end, uh, so you make a call, uh, a couple of simple uh, function calls. You can create a back end job and you can query its status. That back end job sits there and runs until it finishes what it's supposed to do. And that includes waiting for things. If it crashes, the status call will tell you that it has crashed. Then I replace the communication channel between the uh, central system and the remote servers with another instance of this procedure call thing, or this communication protocol. And a couple of simple functions later, uh, the back end stuff, or even the front end stuff if it wants to, could make a call directly to the server with a particular request get an answer back synchronously and go ahead and work with the results. So you'll get immediate success or fail. Or you'll get a synchronous success or fail. Uh, and that means that there's, uh, we're back down to the, a sensible number of demons. And the server, remote servers now are authenticating the request from the central server instead of the other way around. And that also means that the request coming in from the central server to the remote server happens immediately. This greatly simplified the actual structure of the front end code for a great many things. It uh, it removed uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, queuing and uh, 
uh, duplicated code, and it made the backend code that actually accomplishes things, uh, the, the central logic code on the central server, simpler because now it was just straightforward procedural code that went step by step by step by step and waited as long as it need to at each stage of the game. And it also gave me flexibility on the interface side so that the uh, front end could wait for a background call to finish and then provide a synchronous result back to the user. That would be useful for a command line thing running in cron or something like that. Or the front end on a web page could launch the call, the, uh, the uh, process, say through Ajax or, or otherwise, and then Using Ajax again, it could periodically query for the state status of the thing that was being done and show the result. It gives much more flexibility in what you can do. And it also means that if there is something that you need to get immediate feedback from what's the configuration on the server for something, you can make that call directly to the server and then you can get your result and do something with it. Or if the call fails, you'll know and you can put up an error message right away. You don't have stuff sitting around in a work order queue, uh, slowing things down every time something pulls for work. You don't have stacks and stacks and stacks of stuff that could build up when things fail. Uh, if, a, if the system restarts, you don't have any work orders that could restart unexpectedly. Uh, basically, Everything is uh, settled uh, right away. Uh, so I got a lot of improvements and substantial code simplification as a result of this change in implementation. You'll probably note that I've got that communication demon between the client the remote servers and the central server in all the versions of the system. That's a pretty good indicator that it's necessary complexity. There has to be a communication path there. So uh, I'm reasonably certain that given the restrictions on how this system has to operate, then I'm down to the necessary complexity in the general relationship between the pieces. That says nothing about the complexity and implementation of the web interfaces and that sort of thing. But it does give you a good idea how what looks like a great design on paper, that two-level work order system with a, with a third level going to the servers themselves, it looks good on paper, or it did to me at the time. But when it came down to actually building it, it turned out that it was less than ideal. It, it wasn't a good design choice. It took me a while to realize what was wrong with it, but it does turn out that it wasn't the best choice. And that was clear fairly early on. And if I had been thinking clearly at the time, or thinking carefully at the time, I would have realized that, stepped back, and rethought things before I implemented that two-level system in the first place. But, alas, hindsight is, as they say, 2020. Uh, I should have, but it didn't occur to me at the time. Whether that was lack of experience or just I didn't see uh, what was going on, but that was a real problem. Now, this isn't the only time I've actually had something like that happen. Uh, I had something similar happen with a communication protocol I was implementing where I was trying to implement the whole thing in one monolithic process from the configuration GUI uh, or user interface to the actual protocol implementation to some other bits that are ancillary to making it work. 
And doing that, I by trying to build it all in one monolithic process, I introduced a massive amount of complexity to every aspect of it because every aspect of it had to tie into the user interface. And the user interface had to be able to tie into every aspect of it to do its job. That was a problem. And I actually tried to implement that and I got um, like 5,000 lines of code down the, down the road and I realized that I was getting bogged down in details, it was getting tedious and things were getting complicated and I, I just wasn't, wasn't going to finish. It was just wasn't going to uh, give me a functional result in the end. This time I recognized I was going down the wrong road though. And I backed up and I thought, how could I do that differently? And then I did just, then I thought about the Unix philosophy of, uh, you have a bunch of programs that do one thing and do it well, and then you can chain them together. Now, I knew I couldn't chain the, you know, like do this uh, with uh, the protocol necessarily. The protocol implementation itself would have to be monolithic. Uh, just due to the way it works. But I didn't have to link, uh, merge the communication channel setup process into the communication protocol process. I realized I could have some sort of a shim, sets up the communication channel, and then launches the, uh, the protocol implementation with that uh, communication channel already attached to its standard input and standard output. When I realized that, I also realized that I could separate out the user interface aspect of it completely. That could be a separate program altogether or no program whatsoever. And then you would run your communication shim and that you tell that to launch your protocol implementation with whatever uh, parameters that needed to uh, access the local stuff on the computer. So the specification of this, this number means this file or, or what have you. Parsing command line options is easy. So the communication protocol implementation now read its command line set up a little bit of state, global state, and then went on its merry way talking the protocol. The communication shims could be something as simple as SOCAT or uh, a custom built shim that sets up a serial port or what have you. And all it has to do is set it up, execute the uh, communication protocol attached to the right communication path. That shim only needs parameters necessary for its communication path. You don't need some sort of grand unified description of communication paths. So that meant I could implement that simply. So a serial shim just needed a speed and what to execute for the uh, pr uh, protocol implementation. Um, there was already an existing one that worked for TCP, multiple ones in fact, so I could just use that. Uh, and if I ever choose to build a user interface, I can build that in any programming language I want, totally unrelated to the uh, programs that actually implement the communication path. Now here's the magic thing. Instead of getting nowhere after 20 or 30 hours of fiddling uh, under the monolithic scheme, with this separated out scheme, the protocol implement implementation became nearly dead simple, just tedious, and you know I had to implement the aspects of the protocol. You know, um, the sh communication shims were simple, and I didn't need a UI because I could test everything without it. So now I had a system that was not dependent on the UI existing. 
the UI became the command line interface, the usual command line interface. So I was able to develop the protocol implementation, that, and this was a reference implementation, so it needed to be as simple as possible. And I could attach it to, say, a serial shim or, a, or what have you, and I'd be able to test the protocol. And it works pretty well, actually. And it took me six or eight hours, and I had a working implementation. Modulo, the usual bugs you write. So this was another case of unnecessary complexity derailing a project. The unnecessary complexity in this case was trying to lump everything into one big monolithic lump. Uh, that meant that everything depended on everything else. By separating it out, I removed that dependency. Now, I do lose one potential useful feature that you might have by lumping it all together. And that is, I can't actually share the local system state between multiple protocol instances. The thing though, is it turns out that the usual case for using this protocol isn't going to need that. It's going to be a single instance and it's not going to require multiple uh, instances talking on the same uh, shared state. So what I'm losing is a minor uh, feature that's not really necessary compared to a massive amount of complexity that was going to completely derail my ability to implement the project. So what that means is if you're having trouble building your project, look carefully for that unnecessary complexity that you might have introduced into things. And remember that sometimes separating it out into pieces reduces the overall complexity. So while in my provisioning system, uh, it turned out that uh, trying to lump everything together into one grand unified process overcomplicated things. Uh, separating it out also overcomplicated things. Uh, so I needed to come up with a happy medium. Uh, in my protocol implementation case, lumping it together in a grand unified thing made things really complicated, but separating it out on sensible boundaries made it work nicely. Okay, so you're probably sold on the idea that unnecessary complexity uh, causes trouble with implementing your project. Uh, but how do you identify what's unnecessary and what's necessary? Well, you have to go back to your problem definition. What do you have to accomplish? Look at the steps that have to be done to accomplish it. Look at what, where those steps have to happen and look at the bare minimum necessary to accomplish your task. Do you need that user interface? Do you need everything to share a common central state? Do you need all of that? You probably don't. And if you don't, try removing that from your requirements and see what you're left with. You may realize that now you've got an obvious division point or two, and then you can actually think about, does dividing it at that point actually simplify the process? Or does any complexity I get from splitting it there give me a benefit that, that outweighs the cost of the added bits? So in a lot of cases, a UI adds complexity, but turns out to be necessary or adds a useful benefit. But the UI being embedded in everything else, that may not actually be necessary. So you need to look at what needs to communicate with what. And you need to look at how it has to communicate. How urgent is it? Is it interactive? Is it batch? Uh, type communication where you can set something going and then learn about the result later. You know, that sort of thing. You need to think about that sort of thing. 
Uh, you need to break any preconceived notions you have on how a program should operate. Uh, a lot of people have the notion that a program should have this nice, grand, unified GUI and just do things in response to the GUI. And that may be the right choice for some programs. But for others, it almost certainly isn't. For demon-style programs, for instance, things that listen for something and do things, those ones, it's almost certainly not the right interface, the right solution. So. Uh, you need to think about that sort of thing. Uh, and the other thing is when you're implementing something and it just is bogging down and you're not making progress and you just can't keep track of what's going on, that's, that's a, a good indicator that you need to step back and look at what you're doing and think if the design makes sense. Maybe you're having trouble because you've got a bad design. Maybe you're having trouble because although it's a decent design, it's more complicated than it needs to be. Or maybe you're having trouble because the problem you're trying to solve is just that difficult. Uh, there's no hard, fast rule on separate this out and you'll get a good result. Uh, it's a case-by-case -case analysis. And you need to think about it in that light. You need to look at your individual problems uh, without preconceived notions without trying to shoehorn it into some other problem that you already know how to solve. Look at the each individual problem on its own merits and then see if maybe there's a simpler way to do it. You'll probably thank yourself in the long run if you find, find that simpler way. Anyway, that's a fairly long ramble on the topic of complexity and, uh, and programming. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, remember to uh, subscribe if you want to be notified of future videos. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.